Hey everybody, this is Rhino, and we're back to another recording of Hearthstone. We are on the European account. We unfortunately did not get everything done on the America's account. I may have to do that off screen. Uh, let's see, what do I want to trade out here? Today, by the way, is Friday, May 3rd. Uh, let's see. Shaman or Warlock? Which one do I think... I want to play more or less of. Ah, uh, let's reroll this. Okay, so we need to play some mage and some rogue and some shaman. That's hopefully not going to take too much effort. So rogue, I'm going to avoid since I was playing rogue on the main account. So mage and shaman. Uh, let's see how the shaman deck works because I imagine if it's a Murloc deck, then we could probably get some victories with that pretty easily. And then move forward. Uh, let's see. Thrall versus Jaina. Meanwhile, we have tons of games to talk about. And so I want to just burn through everything. Yes, this is a Murloc deck. Exactly what I suspected. So we have a game on Steam here called Doom AI, uh, I guess. This is an interesting art style in the characters, but it seems like most of the game is more of a RPG zoomed out experience. So this art style in particular is not something you're going to see. I would be surprised if this isn't a Chinese RPG. Uh, $3.99 Simplified Chinese, yes. I, wonder. Um, little time. I suspect the quality is not great. <laughs> Inherently, you, you kind of have to say that with every Chinese product, uh, don't you? Is that I heavily suspect the quality is not, not that good on a lot of Chinese products. And give them enough time, certainly, a couple decades and the, their quality of game development might be great. And why will it improve so fast is a question almost, that is almost political as far as whether they're stealing technology, which they are, or whether they just once exposed outside of the Great Firewall of China to the level of quality of games that exist, that they realize, oh, we can do a lot better. Uh, but that's not the point we're at right now, so Chinese quality products in general, but video games in particular, are still the equivalent of saying low quality products. Speaking of low quality products here, we have a, what I assume is a Chinese game called Private Model, where you can pose this character and put her in different outfits and her wrists are bound and doing light bondage I suppose rope bondage on it um, let's see yeah English and simplified Chinese it was, it's basically just a photo mode uh, the tagged with nudity and sexual content by the way the difference between a game like this and a Japanese low low effort game where you would, might have the exact same themes is what well, Japanese one would, would be more anime looking, certainly. Um, but also, they would try to throw something else into it. Um, you wouldn't just have the photo mode. You would have some kind of dungeon crawler, some kind of visual novel, some kind of story in connection to something that's gameplay. Uh, when you just take all of that out and then in this case they're selling the game for six dollars and ninety nine cents with no discount uh, that is asking quite a lot for a photo mode with one model that does not even look that good it honestly looks like there might only be two or three outfits in the entire game also <laughs> Let's see. Deal one damage to everybody. 
transform. So yeah, that that is that. I guess all to say about that game. That was like, yeah. Don't get don't get confused. Don't get tricked. Don't buy a photo mode game just because it's trying to sell on lewdness. Um, Xbox One has this bundle that. Why is my mouse cursor over here? I don't know that either one of these games. Distrust and Goliath Premium Survival Bundle. I've never heard of either one of these. It's from Owlware Entertainment, eHome Entertainment Development. I've never heard of either one of these games. And yet, it's. It's just, I guess, maybe a console exclusives uh, that didn't make it to PC or didn't catch any uh, any coverage here we go I think we're gonna win good old Murloc for the victory hmm this is an example in particular where I would want to have more places where I could make more decks. That way I could have a um, a Murloc deck in every character class. That would be still pretty doable. Uh, yeah, I could I could have like a Murloc Rogue deck and then get rogue victories when I need to get rogue victories or ma more like a mage I'm trying to see if I can show off this game at any level I guess we can this this game is tag nudity but the next game we have is speaking of comparison to Japanese games we have hentai survive island a combination of lewd low effort cells pitches with that and a survival island minecraft clone uh, this is 69 cents discounted and it's English only now arguably this might be that this is just a low-effort asset flip game of course uh, but this might not be made by uh, a Easterners at all it's very possibly made by just a low-effort Western developer or possibly a low-effort Russian developer, or who knows. Um, we really haven't done enough research to figure out how many of the troll games are actually Russian troll games. I would be very surprised if it wasn't the case that a lot more are developed by Eastern Bloc Russian developers and then pretend and to look like other kinds of games from other areas. I also wouldn't be surprised if there's some South American developers that make a lot of troll games or even African developers that make troll games. Alright, so what do we need to do now? We got that victory that got one daily quest done. Next we need minions that cost five or more in rogue class cards. So hopefully if I just play rogue this will uh, this will just play five cost cards there's a couple there's four let's see uh, next we have a game on Steam called Om Salvi's Sunscreen which that seems like that is a random as uh, assortment of words and this looks like this is a random assortment of items it, it seems like it is probably just asset flips. Two dollars and ninety-nine cents. Um, hmm. Here's a question and a. For, this is so self-indulgent and pretentious. No ish, Sherlock. Yeah, that's your. That's your 
frequently asked question that you wrote the question yourself and you wrote the answer and that's your level of professionalism for your game of course Ome Salvi's sunscreen not a game that needs to be on the fall list uh, Tech Raptor has another cool here disc jam PS4 name change issue resolved new accounts will to be merged uh, Let's see, earlier last month, a much request feature to allow Sony fans to change their PlayStation Network ID was finally put in motion. Unfortunately, Info Games didn't play well to feature, and Disc Jam was one of those games. The issue has now been resolved, and although the list of games will name cha with name change issues has yet to be updated. Um, I don't know how new accounts are going to be merged. Maybe that is an automated process they can do because they can do it based off of a based off of your uh, PlayStation's hardware ID instead of your PlayStation's user ID. It's not really much of a story, frankly. Is it? Yeah, Sony put out a name change feature that didn't really work for every game. And now they're trying to, they're going to just slowly fix it one game at a time until most of the games are fixed. I imagine some will never be fixed. Uh, Gematsu has an article here. Tokyo School Life for the Switch will have a limited physical run after it's been announced. Limited to 5,000 prints, pre-orders now available. These limited runs, particularly in things like this, which is, assumedly this is a visual novel, uh, that hmm. I, I assume this is more to sell them at a high price than it is to uh, actually uh, let's see. Uh, I don't think it, it has anything to do with actual demand per se or or anything else uh yeah but if you were to do say the minimal run of an average game i imagine you would be required to potentially this guy's uh potentially get 30 or 40 thousand units printed even in a first run and a game like Tokyo School Life, which is just a visual novel that probably isn't that interesting, probably won't sell 30,000 30, physical units. Um, this has been certainly the factor that has changed, uh, changed Steam in a lot of ways, is visual novels looked like they didn't sell because they could never possibly uh, sell the same numbers as a triple a shooter or something like that but if you give them a bit more of a fair chance they they will sell in comparison to uh, hey, uh, lights out in, in comparison to other digital games uh, but in all fairness i would say visual novels have not taken over the video game industry in any way it's not there hasn't been a large growing number of fans that have gotten into playing visual novels over the past decade. Right. Two to an undamaged. And then do this. And then do this. And then. This. Nothing. Oh. And then double time and double time. There we go. Moving on, Game of Switch has an article. Phoenix Games has acquired the UK studio Well Played Games. We already talked about this in the previous recording. Uh, well Played Games seems to be making a mobile card game, if I recall correctly. Yeah, Warhammer combat cards, 
so it's not not in the realm of a big game or anything like this. And in fact, we might run into a lot of repeated news, come to think of it. Uh, GameIndustry.biz has an article, Activision Blizzard sees the predicted quarter, quarter one to start uh, to a transition year. Revenue is down largely due to the 16% drop in Blizzard earnings as the segment begins in a year with no major frontline releases, end quote. Uh, so it's odd that Activision here is trying to blame Blizzard uh, because it, it would be Blizzard in Battlefield, it, it would be Activision in Battlefield's lack of sales, wouldn't it? It feels like it. That's more to blame than anything else. Four damage. Play ah, this. This guy's tough. Um, now Activision Blizzard does seem to have some problems with. Uh, I guess maybe there's no major release on World of Warcraft this year. Uh, Hearthstone is just being Hearthstone. It's not looking to do anything more. The Heroes of the Storm has been abandoned and put in. Uh, Diablo's no new Diablo game is coming out. Um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah, hey, I don't know if there's. Uh, I don't know if what the real problem there is. Uh, I guess Overwatch is not succeeding well enough. Uh, I think there's probably a huge failure as far as Overwatch to not expand that into more of a story based single player uh, expansion of some sort. Like, Overwatch doesn't always have to be a team based multiplayer game. You could bring those characters into something more interesting. Uh, like, even if you're just gonna make a new World of Warcraft in the Overwatch universe, that's something to do. But yeah, things definitely do not look good um, as far as the... Let's see. As far as Activision Blizzard looks. Too much time here. Do this. And do this. Moving on, Gamma Sutra has an article here. Former temp, former temps claim Neverrealm has a long history of exploitation and abuse. Uh, Neverrealm being the developer of Mortal Kombat. Uh, this is the story that is growing, certainly. And unfortunately, the the thing is they've been calling it crunch when it really should have been called abuse and overworking and and Japanese 
term I think is called Kosu, which is working yourself to death. Um, it should have been called abuse at the at the very beginning. Um, the idea of hiring QA people, forcing them to work, or uh, overtime or overpaid or overtime or just work extremely long hours, and and then knowing that you're not going to keep any of those quality assurance employees after the game has launched and you're just gonna fire them all um, is is abusive and unfair uh, it's an abuse that happens throughout all of the United States unfortunately uh, so uh, I don't know what's what can be done with that other than unionization or changing of the laws in the United States uh, abusing the programmers like crazy and forcing them into crunch the the idea of crunch was originally something that would happen if there was a mistake if something really bad happened and it is understandable that an employee in any field might say all right i'll do some overtime to help out the team and and get this done this deadline done because this unforeseeable thing happened uh, but the truth is even in that case even in the most honest case in which overtime is needed you probably still shouldn't do it like you, you probably shouldn't put your own mental health and physical health above uh, uh, well, not above, but below the needs of a corporate entity that is a soulless, humanless uh, creature that will only mind. chew you up and spit you out. Um, like, but in video games in particular, Crunch has moved from being a item that happened in rare instances to an event that is planned for and scheduled Here and is just go. gonna happen regardless and it's not good for the for even video game companies in the long run it's it's just burning out your employees that's why we've seen over the past decade a long list of employees li leaving companies starting in starting different companies uh, quitting jobs or just retiring in total in completeness or quitting in completeness because of the amount of stress. It really shouldn't be a stressful job to work at a video game company. It's not life and death, it's not brain surgery, it's literally just sitting in a chair and programming done at a realistic, reasonable pace. That can be a very fun, entertaining, rewarding experience. I know because I have programmed things. Uh, but, but once you add that extra stress, once you, you go, there always must be more. There must be more code. There must be more work. There must be more hours. Uh, once it went from a small private company that owned the while making video games into publicly owned corporations that's when the investors came in that's when these cutthroat investors said we must get more money every quarter no matter what otherwise we're going to uh, not invest anymore video games got frankly too big for their own good and that doesn't mean that you can't make a small game like Hellblade Sooner Sacrifice and make it look good it just means you can't have things like FIFA come out on an annual basis uh, when really there isn't enough of a market for FIFA to exist uh, and clearly that is the case otherwise FIFA wouldn't be full of microtransactions Inherently, all of these problems that that I talk about, specifically in video games, companies happen on all companies, and it would simply be easiest to limit the amount of 
sizes of corporations in general. Uh, limit public investment and private investment. So businesses can't get beyond a certain level. Microsoft is, I believe, uh, approaching or has crossed a trillion dollars in market uh, cap. If Microsoft had been limited to a billion dollars of a market cap, it might focus in and work on a few products instead of just a bunch of random products. Uh, there very easily could be a breakup of Microsoft uh, where one part of Microsoft is about server-side services and one part of Microsoft is about uh, consumer-side services such as Windows and then a third part of Microsoft would be the Xbox uh, gaming services and if Xbox was was its own company instead of uh, instead of a uh, sub just a department inside of Microsoft there would have been a lot of things that Microsoft wouldn't have had to do and probably a lot of things that Microsoft would have done a lot better if they weren't told that they have to integrate certain technologies or ideas or concepts from other departments in, inside of Microsoft. Um, let's see. Alright, well this next game is called Taboo's Cracks. It's tagged with sexual content nudity. And it seems like it's a card matching game with pictures of anime girls tied up in rope bondage. Um, it's kind of explicit in the screenshots. It's 59 cents. It seems like there's probably going to be an attempt at a series oh called gosh. Taboos. Um, but yeah, this is another one of these low effort sex games trying to sell on sex definitely not something I would recommend anybody buy but also nice to see that it's not uh, getting flagged or disallowed on Steam so although arguably I would say the quality of of this game if it was disallowed on Steam wouldn't really, really be a problem yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these these adult games that come on Steam actually have stolen the adult content from even other adult uh, games. I doubt that's really the case because you would think they, they would get caught doing that pretty easily uh, but it, it would make some sense too when you have large differences in the visual quality for the gameplay part versus the cinematic part. Hmm. And it seems like this Friday was another day in which a round of these games got approved. Um, it does seem like that's the case. Now this also might be because we are at the end of Japanese Golden Week, which I believe is over now. Uh, so this could just be a case of a bunch of Japanese games of all types have been um, have been released to Steam. Let's see if we can how much of this I can show off. Hmm. Yeah, this next game on Steam is called Azure Wing Rising Gale, which I think is several names mixed together of animes. To make it seem like it's based off a licensed anime product when it really isn't. Uh, it's a visual novel tagged with nudity and sexual content. Uh, 
it doesn't look particularly good quality though. They want nine dollars and ninety nine cents. I've never heard of this developer. So I've never heard of this options. publisher. Vice versa. It's English only, which is odd. And quite frankly, if you are gonna sell a game like that, you would want the Japanese vocals too. Um, I usually work Job's done. I want to play these My hand expensive cards cool. before we try and win. Hmm. We already talked about this. Uh, Tech Raptor has an article here. Gearbox gives the first look at Borderlands 3 gameplay. Hmm. Which, you would think there would be more information and more hype around this story than a lot of the other stories. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Seems like down here it talks about stories and characters and zones um, and gameplay and combat. This is... Let's see what this is as far as... So, you can play as Lilith. Or this is 23 minutes, so you have to skip like 23 minutes into the game. Hmm. So, yeah, this is like a long presentation. Somebody made an intro. This is not Borderlands 3 that's being shown right now, though. Uh, Somebody made the argument, and I think it's fairly fair argument here. So yeah, this is not really going to show much. This is a four hour is and 56 minute video that is probably going to get you 10 to 12 minutes of actual gameplay. Um, let's see. Not a valid target. My hand is too full. So, yeah, someone made the fair argument that the, the thing people have been complaining about for a long time is that the mainstream video game journalists have been taken to these press releases, these events, and shown footage that that they really can't question or verify is actually even running on a on anything less than the most high-powered PCs possible or that it's a video game that's running at all and it's not just a video being played and made to look like it's it's uh, it's interactive um, so for the Borderlands 3 event that happened seems like they brought a lot of influencers in and uh, a lot of youtubers and streamers and such and so the streamers are getting that same hype spe same special treatment and and effectively this is a ad or a sponsorship i mean they're uh, according to the FCC, you're l gaining something of monetary value, whether it is a free plane trip to the event, or a free ticket to the event, or room and board, uh, anything like that. Even even if they're just handing you a bottle of water, you're basically getting paid at that point. You've been given some kind of gift or graft. Uh, graft. Um, and even if you refuse to accept anything, you flew yourself out to this event, you did not even accept a bottle of water from it, uh, and so you 100% paid, and so you would think, uh, you, you could truly and accurately claim that you are not getting something of value some kind of extra benefit which you still would be getting because you're allowed to this event that was not open to the public uh, but even if all those parts were eliminated you're still seeing the game 
when you go to an event like this in a very different fashion and in a very different mood than what your average video game player is. Uh, people who buy Borderlands 3 from the Epic Store are going to have a much bigger, uh, different experience in those first five minutes of playing Borderlands 3 than somebody who is at a convention center with assumedly some kind of loud music playing trying to get you hyped up and announcers trying to get you pumped and hyped uh, you're just so buying into the hype and you're gonna come out with such a different feeling uh, than what a normal person would have that that it's not beneficial it's not professional and good journalism to go to these kind of events it's better as a streamer or a new video game critic uh, or as a small indie video game critic it's better just to stay home and play games just do what gamers do stay home play games uh, and that's about it gamers don't read game articles too much uh, gamers do watch I, I would hope they watch a little bit of streamers and youtubers uh, but the number one thing gamers do the thing that defines a gamer is that they play games in their house in their setup uh, at a reasonable pace uh, and you want to try to emulate that experience as much as possible uh, so you're not getting the story or getting the narrative wrong because uh, you've been emotionally tricked. So yeah, that is an argument that should be made to streamers as much as it should be made to to the big video game journalists. These, these events, for the most part, you shouldn't go to. Uh, this Borderlands 3 event is a great example of one that should be skipped. You knew Borderlands 3 was going to be uh, talked about and shown. Everything that is talked about and shown will be handed out in a press packet to all the all the journalists later anyways. There's no point to go to it. Uh, maybe if you're going to E3 and you're trying to see new things or things you don't know about, expand your horizons, that might make a little bit of sense, but even now most people are realizing e3 is not really worth it um, let's see i i half wonder i just saw a boot slide uh, ability used i half wonder if half of the bullet storm abilities get added to this game um, and that's why they did that deal with People Can Fly to be the publisher of it. It's just so they wouldn't get sued for for using the same abilities. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm looking at this footage and it frankly just looks like more Borderlands. For better or worse, uh, there will be new abilities, there will be new enemies. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that maybe some of the enemies and characters from the previous games get integrated a little bit better. Because both in Borderlands 1 and 2 that was a bit of a problem. Where you, you didn't see as many stags or racks as, as I would have liked in Borderlands 2. They kind of just disappeared. Um, but of course I would be super irritated. If Borderlands 3 had a ton of Hyperion robots, because that was basically all that game had. Someone's spectating me, so I guess they have a watch and run. move on from Borderlands 3 though hmm. yeah unfortunately that's not the only story about Borderlands 3 Tech Raptor also has Borderlands 3 will have microtransactions despite statements to the contrary um, let's see here's a quote from Randy Pitchford 
uh, quote, we're going to do some uh, campaign DLC, and I'm sure we're going to do all kinds of fun customizations like heads and skins, but we're not doing any of that free-to-play junk. Uh, which, okay, sure, it's not free-to-play. Uh, there's not going to be any mi microtransactions. There's not going to be any of that nonsense. And see, he just really misspoke, and if you just own up and say, I meant to say reoccurring microtransactions would have been more more accurate, or I, I just misspoke. Uh, instead, he went on a Twitter rant against Game Informer, try, who was trying to just set the record straight. Um, this guy's uh, toast. As far as what, what he meant by that, because there is microtransactions in the game. There will be skins for DLC for sale. Um, hmm. Let's see. So, here we have Game Informer saying, Despite CEO Randy Pitchford's comment about no microtransactions in Borderlands 3, during today's live stream, we've been told cosmetic items are still purchasable. Let's see. And his first, is this his first response? This come on guys, uh, poopy clickbait headline. Literally seconds before I said that I make made it very clear that I'm going to do more cosmetic stuff like we did in Borderlands 2. You know, so I was talking about premium currency and loot boxes and kind of stuff not being in our game. Uh, this is a abridged conversation uh, from what I saw this conversation went on for several more replies of uh, Randy Pitchford going all off on them which public public response here and uh, no reason to to do this uh, publicly he could have contacted game Informer or through direct message privately or he probably has much better context than that uh, but he made it incredibly public and came out on the attack and made himself look ridiculous and instead of just admitting a simplistic mistake. And it's just another bit of an example of Randy Pitchford not being a good boss. The fact that I know Randy Pitchford's name. Like, I can't tell you who's in charge of Ubisoft. I can't tell you who's in charge of EA. I can't tell you who's in charge of Activision. I don't know any of those CEOs' names. You know why? Because they don't cause drama. They just do their jobs, for better or worse. Uh, but Randy Pitchford, he's known. His name is known. Uh, when it comes to credibility, his checks are bad, and he and they have a picture of him behind the the cash register saying, "Do not." Except checks from this guy uh, when it comes to credibility. Uh, and that's really a shame for Gearbox. And if not, hey, lights out. The video game industry in general. Here we go. Hmm. Uh, moving on, we have a GameIndustry.biz article. Microsoft joins the Climate Leadership Council. A uh, company will be the first tech organization to join a controversial group pursuing carbon fees and legal immunity for oil giants. Uh, wow. I don't understand legal immunity for oil giants. Um... I don't know particularly why uh, why Microsoft would want to join that council, but all, in all fairness, Microsoft has joined a lot of council, councils for one reason or another. Hmm. Let's see, we need to figure out what would be big ticket minions to play. And I think staying with Rogue is probably the best move. So let's just stay with Rogue and keep playing. 
Let's see. It says the organization's proposed actions have been met with some criticism, both due to a concern that carbon fees would be offloaded to consumers and due to the legal immunity they would potentially grant the country's largest fossil fuels, fuels users. Other participating members in this council council is AT&T. Okay, so you immediately know it's an evil organization. Uh, General Motors. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, PepsiCo, Oil Giants, BP, ExxonMobil, Shell, and Total, and ConocoPhillips, and organizations such as the Conservation International and the World Wildlife Foundation. Most of those corporate, corporate entities are, are, are considered evil in my book, as is probably most corporate entities in general are. Uh, so maybe Microsoft plans on doing some polluting uh, in the future. I don't know how this, though, as an article, really has anything to do with the games industry.biz. Do we really need to follow every single story surrounding Microsoft just because Microsoft has an Xbox division? Uh, that that seems ridiculous to me. Let's see. Next we have a game on Steam called Rival Nation Wars. Uh, who are these people rivals of? That seems like that was just a collection of flags. Uh, whatever this is, it's $8.99. It looks like it's a low effort troll game. Looks like an NES game. Worse quality than most NES games. Yeah. This doesn't deserve any more coverage than that. I fight. I mentioned this before, but here's a Tech Raptor article. Epic Games Store update reveals delays on features following strong sales. So the game. The Epic Store has strong sales, therefore they're going to do less work to make the store good. Um, in the wake of strong sales, the storefront announced a delay in the development of features. Mm. Development of features roadmap, one of the most glaring issues with the storefront by the admission of both enthusiasts and detractors. What seems like a monumental task building a full digital storefront for millions of users is bound to have plenty of roadblocks. So Epic developers have shifted features from April to May and June. This is mainly due to the fact that they're focusing on supporting online features required for new game releases. Uh, so yeah, the game, the game sales are good, therefore they're going to... Um, it, it's so silly to say it out loud. Uh, we're succeeding, therefore we're going to, to do less work. So we don't succeed as much. It's kind of the only way you can take that. I fight. Uh, uh, trying to be fair here, putting out development and feature roadmaps are stupid in the first place. Particularly if you have a date on it. Uh, but if you promised a date, you should stick to the date. This is another instance of Epic as a corporation not keeping its word. Uh, and yeah, you want people to keep their word as much as possible. Hold it. Hmm. Uh, meanwhile, I think it is also worth mentioning, and this isn't, I don't think, mentioned in this article, is the Epic Store did exist a year before it started selling other other games it was it came out nearly a year before before the first third party game was listed and they did nothing in that time to to get it working as a storefront and, and as anything other than just a proprietary launcher uh, on top of that nobody asked for the epic store in the first place so they could have easily just uh, I fight. 
uh, just not release the Epic Store until they were ready. No refunds. Hmm. No refunds. Give that minion a turn to get ready. Let me go home! Hmm. I fight. So yeah, this is certainly a problem of their own making for just not planning ahead before going forward with it. Um, which I think is a bit of a hint. I won't say it's actual evidence, but it's a bit of a hint that Randy Pitchford and Gearbox asked the Epic Store to start selling third-party titles. Uh, and that was the deadline that was created. Um, is an idea of trying to better negotiate or or renegotiate cuts uh, for Epic uh, for for Borderlands Three. Mm. Moving on, TechRaptor has an article here. Survive tight quarters in Red Solstice 2 Survivors. This looks like a top down twin stick shooter. Maybe it's an isometric twin stick shooter. I want to see just a little bit of the gameplay here. And before I ignore it completely. Uh, yeah, it seems top down for most gameplay. Is this coming out? It will release later this year. So this is just a hype article. Yeah. And that kind of did the opposite of hyping me on it because it was not visually impressive. Mm. Let's see. Next we have a game on Steam called Life Source Episode 1. Hmm. This looks kind of interesting. But it's going the episodic route, which certainly is a a tick mark against it. This looks like it's a 3D mm. platformer. Maybe there's a lot of assets in this, certainly. Um, see an evil wizard poisoned the water, a young girl named something will have a great adventure. Mm. This is 69 cents. Yeah, that's too cheap for what this game should be. Uh, so, at this price tag, you know there's never going to be enough polish to this to make it a good product. And it's episode one of something that almost certainly would never get a episode two. Alright, four damage to a minion. This and this. If we look here at the developer of that game, we can see that the only other games that have even gotten rated are mixed at best, and a lot of these games look like low effort games. So, yeah. Developers and asset flippers are getting better and better at making their games look like quality products when they really aren't and that is I guess the growing problem of trying to visually get a general feel of a game when the visuals are specifically designed to make the game look better than it is and that's the importance I suppose of the review system so you can see what people who have actually played the game feel like your back moving on to the next story gameindustry.biz has an article remedy says single player games are stronger than they have ever been uh, reboot develop at reboot develop CEO Terror Vertala examined the new opportunities streaming services will create for independent AAA developers. So this is some quotes you can quote mine. Not everyone loves Remedy games and that's fine with us. That's a good attitude to take. The race is on for Netflix of games. For the next two or three years the big boys are going to invest heavily in this. Eh, it, 
I think the, the streaming concept for games is, is still questionable a little bit. There's another quote, in the games industry, to sell a new platform, you're going to need unique and exclusive content. Nobody likes exclusive content these days. Um, Here we go. Uh, another quote, any one of you with the capability to develop a AAA games, uh, you're going to have lots of interesting opportunities. I wonder if he was talking to recent graduates when he said that. That there is probably a moderate difference between the speech you give at something like GDC where there's a bunch of already established developers and programmers in the room and a speech you would give at a graduation class or at a college um, of, of potentially yet to be hired programmers. Um, but I think that's probably true for a lot of industries is that you give a rah-rah you can do anything type speech to the new graduates and then and then you you give the people who have already got the jobs the, the real download. Um, the light protects me. Let's see. Gamma Sutra has the same article we already talked about. CEO and co-founder Emily Greer departs Congregate uh, for some new job that we have not gotten any information on what that new career path or job is. Um, GameIndustry.biz has the same article. Emily Greer departs Congregate for a new gaming venture. Uh, COO Penny Heretatos to take over as temporary CEO following the co-founder's departure. What's funny here is GameIndustry.biz being more about the industry in general actually gives us useful information about hey who's gonna replace the person that is leaving the job. Here we go. But frankly there's no story if you were forced out or forced to quit uh, a job I think you probably would claim that you're you're leaving amicably anyways and that you're taking on a new business venture even if you don't have any plans at all yeah, that sounds a lot better than just saying oh I was fired or oh I was forced out uh, at CEO level you're basically forced out not fired uh, so yeah until we hear what their next project is and um, typically it takes at least six months until they announce anything you, you never kind of know and in six months time it's pretty easy to um, to forget all about the story hey good tickets don't Here come we go might be a case where I get on a win streak and actually don't play the cards I'm trying to play. TechRaptor has the same article we already talked about. Ubisoft partners with Jinba to take on the gray market key sellers like GTA. Uh, the story I don't think mentions GTA at all from what they said, but uh, they are taking on third party key sellers. I don't know if that is fair to call a gray market really uh, whatever gray market means uh, in any in individual's head let's see no refund hmm. next we have a game on steam that is a bunch of asian characters and it's says so insane west I assume this is a low effort Western platformer uh, Chinese game. Hmm. Yep, early access, three dollars and ninety-nine cents, English and Chinese. Hmm. And westerns as games or westerns as stories or movies have not been 
popular probably for decades with the few exceptions like Red Dead Redemption certainly uh, is one but this guy's toast like, at the time Westerns were the number one form of fiction in the United States but that was back when the United States was much closer to the time in the days of of the Wild West uh, there's very little Wild West in the United States these days and it's long seen ah, since been seen as an antiquated old-fashioned uh, style of storytelling uh, that's unrelatable uh, every now and then we'll get a movie that tries to feel a little bit like a Western ah, but it, this guy's it has a more modern feel and approach to it which makes it not really work Hmm. Let's see. Hey, lights out. There we go. Moving on, Tech Raptor has an article here. Gwent, the Witcher card game review, approving nod. Um I'm still not sure, Gwent. It's something I want to play, but you can see what this is and how Gwent is set up now for multiplayer, player versus player, is rather different from what Gwent was in The Witcher 3. Um, and frankly, I still feel like Gwent is just too simplistic a game. To, to replace Hearthstone or, or even be played for much of a uh, a long amount of time. So yeah, even all these cards on the field is actually a pretty simplistic calculation. Um, but Tech Raptor gives it a 9.0 amazing. Um, We have 10 mana crystals, restore 10 health to your hero. Let's save that for later. Hey! Good tickets! Don't come cheap! Oh. Let's see. I fight. Help! That minion already hey, attacked. Lights out. <sighs> I want to discover another spell. Yeah, let's just discover another spell. There we go. Job done. Yeah, Tech Raptor summarizes this months after the final release. Gwent the Witcher, the card game, is still going strong. The minigame. Turned esports continues, goes through iterations and patches, shedding skins and morphing into a real beast of a card game. It has a wistful past, a solid presence, and a bright future. Pros are deep and in intricate tactical gameplay. I wouldn't think it has that, but maybe they've added that. A generous freemium si system, a variety of factions and archetypes, fascinating fantasy universe, and magnificent uh, art direction. Uh, which that certainly beats out like Yu-Gi-Oh. Cons, it's still lacking some quality of life tweaks and the meta can get stale, which is true for any card game, particularly Hearthstone. Um, let's see. This. And... This. Attack here. Hey, lights out. I fight. Here. One more win should be a win streak, but I might also be close to having all the cards I need to play. Nope, not close to that.
Moving on, uh, Gamatsu has an article, Rock of Ages 2, Bigger and Bolder, is coming to Switch on May 14th. I did not like Rock of Ages 1. If you did, then Rock of Ages 2 makes some sense. Playing it on the Switch might be better than playing it on PC because of the Joy-Cons and the motion support. Uh, but I frankly just found Rock of Ages to be repetitive rock of ages one to be repetitive and boring and it's a shame because it on the face of it looked like it might have been a pretty pretty funny game or an interesting oddity at least and it, it, it lost lost my interest pretty quickly let's see next we have an article from tech raptor pc builder simulate PC Building Simulator 1.2 update and Razer Workshop DLC has been released. So you can integrate Razer products into the PC Building Simulator. Um, slowly, ever so slowly, I think this game is turning into a good piece of software. Arguably, I think probably not much of a game though, and I don't think it ever should try to strive to be much of a game. Hello. It should just continuously get updates with new hardware specs, which I'm sure companies like Razer are more than happy to provide uh, because this might very easily lead to them getting more sales. <laughs> this guy's tough. Uh, Razer in particular, not, not what I would recommend buying for the any of their hardware or their peripherals so the DLC is just I think a green room so the entire room looks very razorfied uh, I wonder. which yeah if you want that hmm that does bring about an interesting question uh, what if you were capable of succeeding uh, and starting a computer shop, which you probably aren't in in the United States. Would you want to decorate it with neon lights and fancy and, and go with the 90s hacker motif? Or would you want to go with maybe clean, clear glass counters, a lot of, a lot of things on display? Uh, do you go more of a Best Buy look where things are on display in bright well lit sections or do you do you go with the dim lit room um, you probably go the Best Buy route I think you go clean counters clean uh, everything you want it, want it bright and shiny and easy to see um, but yeah unfortunately you really can't run a PC shop or a PC repair store or one or the other because nobody really wants to pay what it would actually cost to have a custom PC built and most people don't even need PCs. That's why Chromebooks have become very, very good options for most people is that all they need is something that can launch Chrome and go to websites. They don't need a gaming PC and if you do need a gaming PC you're probably gonna build it yourself even if you've never built one before because it's gotten so simplistic and, and moderately safe to build a PC uh, it used to be a lot more dangerous and a lot more difficult hmm. and the same is true for like electronics repair shops nobody nobody goes to electronics repair shops to fix their VCRs anymore because nobody has VCRs and even if you did have one you'd throw it away and buy a new one or use one. Uh, moving on we have a game on Steam here called Pandemic Express Zombie Escape. It's already rated mixed which is weird because this looks kinda good. It's early access $9.89. Let's see what the negative reviews are. Let's see, I was excited for this game release, but I can't recommend the game at all at the moment. It has some glaring issues that should have been worked out before launch. Uh, movement is clunky. 
uh, the game is stacked with in the infected's favor, so you die a lot. Okay. It's a shame. Uh, but I'm not gonna put a mixed reviewed game, which is being published by Tiny Build, oddly. Uh, that publisher in particular, Tiny Build, who also helped develop the game, could have put more money into it, so it would have been a better, better experience. Instead, it looks like they've just put enough money in it to make it look better than it actually is. Um, I'm just gonna end the turn here. So yeah, there's not a good reason to to put things on the follow list if it's already already reviewed poorly. If it gets better, I may get word of it being better later. Alright. Do this. And then we'll do this. Ah, this guy's toast. And then we'll do this. Here we go. See, next we have a game on Steam called Guard Dirty Duty that's already rated positively. This looks like it's kind of a point and click pixelated art style of a game. It seems like it goes from fantasy to maybe sci fi. Hmm. Yeah, it's a point and click adventure. I'm suckers for point and click adventures. It's $9.99, which is probably a little expensive because I imagine this is a a longer experience than that. Yeah, it seems like it does jump between sci-fi and fantasy, and I don't know um, how that's going to work. But, yeah. This, I think, deserves a follow. We'll see later on if more people still review it positively or if it's just got a unique bump in reviews. As it first came out. The light protects me. this. Uh, Gamatsu has an article here. Pseudo51 teases, quote, another announcement for Momocon 2019. Uh, Pseudo returns following last year's Killer7 announcement. Um, so, ideally, and what he's teasing here is that there would be a, uh, another No More Heroes game coming out, or the current the first No More Heroes game is coming to Steam since Killer7 last year was announced to come to Steam. Uh, that would be cool, I guess. Uh, Momocon 2019 runs from May 22nd at, to the tw well, May 23rd to the 26th at the Georgia Washington Congress Center and Omni Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so, it would be a lot more interesting if it is a No More Heroes 3 than if it's No More Heroes 1 on PC. Either one of those I'm super happy with though, so uh, as long as it's not a complete and bait and switch announcement and there's actually nothing, nothing interesting being announced at all. Um, Can we do this um, and kill this guy? Not Here this turn. Gamatsu uh, has an article here. Gamatsu remembers tr trying to catch up because they had Japanese Golden Week off. Uh, 
The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel 2 for the PS4 launches June 4th in North America and June 7th in Europe. We, I think we pretty much talked about this already. So I guess this is a new announcement, although why the pictures are not really loading. That, mm. Do not attempt to adjust your set. That's just blurry. Uh, we might be approaching the beginning of the end. I might see the end of the tunnel as far as news, which this should be the last game. Um, and then we'll break up and go to the Asian account. Uh, Techcraft has an article, Star Citizen's complaint to the Federal Trade Commission are very rooted in development mismanagement. Uh, last December, we report, uh, Techcraft reported that Star Citizen's Crytek lawsuit be, could be coming to a close. Now a report by PC Gamer Games and PC Games Insider has uncovered that the U United States Federal Trade Commission has received 129 complaints uh -huh. about Star Citizen, the colossal multiplayer Star tr Space Trading Flight Simulator that was first announced as the Kickstarter campaign in 2012. Since then, the development of the game has bloated to a gargantuan proportions as crowdfunding stretched way beyond the Kickstarter campaign to set the 2014 Guinness World Record in the sum of 39,680,576 dollars as the largest single amount ever raised via crowdsourcing. Uh, Story go. Since then, according to the official website, the blah 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 blah. Let's skip some of this. Some backers' complaints mention the game's terrible performance or the fact that it seems to be in perpetual after alpha state. Some even claim it barely runs. So. Uh, the common thread seems to be the lack of focus and the overall feature creep. Chris Roberts, the or Origin Systems veterans, who was the creator of the Seminole Wing Commander franchise, is described as a, quote, bad manager who makes development a chaotic presence. So the Kickstarter funders are upset with Chris Roberts. Uh, I... Wing Commander series? I, maybe I didn't play Wing Commander. Maybe I played TIE Fighter and... Uh, wait a minute. Wasn't it Wing Commander, then TIE Fighter? Isn't that all the same series? Well, if Wing Commander is the games series I'm thinking of, those games were pretty, pretty bad, too. They're probably great for their time, but by modern standards, they, they were not good. Um, <clears throat> Apparently, the complaints not only come from Kickstarter funders, but also from team members. Um, Job's done. Because the article continues, the FTC complaints and the complaints from the team members build on top of the issue that was previously mentioned in a leak letter from David Jennison, a former 3D artist, says, artist in the Star Citizen team, which mentioned so in the Forbes report, Jennison tried to explain to HR why he completed only five characters in 17 months. Quote, all the decisions for the character pipeline and approach had to be made by Roberts. It's become clear that this was a company-wide pattern. Chris Roberts dictates all. So yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath if you're trying to play Star Citizen. I doubt there's ever going to be a finished product in there that people will enjoy. Uh, and now it also has that stigma around it's around that, so... 
Um, so uh, even if you were uh, interested in Star Citizen, you, you probably are going to be surrounded by a bunch of angry and upset people uh, who, who own the game despite because they kickstarted it. Uh, moving on, we have a game here called Flappy Flappy VR, which is a Flappy Bird clone in VR. I would say that of all the Flappy Bird clones in VR, this one at least makes some sense. It is emulating that terrible game pretty well and making you flap your arms in VR. Um, it's $2.99, which is particularly cheap for a VR game. Let's see. Hmm. Here we go. Let's see. So yeah. If you have VR, if you wanna only spend two dollars and ninety-nine cents to play Flappy Bird in VR and look like an idiot to anybody watching you play the game, this this is something that doesn't look too terrible although very possibly if it weren't a VR game this should be a 69 cents uh, game I'm just gonna keep on irritating them. Here we go. Hmm. next we have a story from gameindustry.biz Syndicate or Syndicate, I don't know if how you pronounce that. Founders go AWOL, which is a military term for absent without leave. I'm not sure if legally speaking a employee or employer can go AWOL. Uh, but they disappeared apparently, owing the staff and contractors over thirty thousand pounds. Uh, the Spanish indie publisher collapses without answers as the founders cultivate a after the founders cultivate toxic work environments. There is something to be said that if I was to try to run a business, I'm not sure I know what needs to be done to, so many to avoid the cultivation of a hostile work environment. I won't use the phrase toxic work environment because frankly, I think that uh, phrase toxic is this overused and so abused. Let me go um, but yeah uh, former staff and contractors for the Spanish indie publisher syndicate reported they owed more than 30,000 pounds in unpaid wages and services having heard nothing from the management in five months uh, the publisher was pegged to be the devolver digital spam went uh, of Spain went dark in December last year and hasn't responded to any queries from staff since. The fact that somebody is not showing up after a couple of days, you should be, hmm. well, frankly, you should be reporting them missing to the police uh, uh, if more than anything else. Uh, clearly, this is a case of, Let me go of people holding on out hopes for five months for no reason when you've not heard anything from them yeah th they're gone you should take your stuff out of the office you should probably steal some stuff out of the office I'm, I'm not giving legal advice because that would be very illegal but you should just abandon it and just be like yeah this is this is not not gonna happen at the very least you stop showing up for work uh, they must have had a live telecommuting going on that this would even feel normal um, and it makes even less sense uh, because they were given a month's holiday over Christmas suddenly uh, like after giving a month's holiday and Christmas, staff showed up to work to find out the office closed mm. and an email inviting them to sign their resignations. Uh, so they were... 
so the quite a story here I don't know if there's really too much to report here it's another sleazy company doing a scam more than I think a sleazy video game company actually doing a video game specific uh, action um, I think this one in particular just kind of fall, can be filed over yeah somebody took the money and ran which can happen certainly in any industry Moving on, this is probably the most exciting news f to me. Uh, Platinum Games teases two Noli, two new wholly owned IPs, new title uh, that has never been done before. So, um, it's not going to be another Nier game. It's not going to be a sequel to Nier Automata, which I don't know if Platinum had the license to Nier Automata, if that was one of their IPs. And it's not going to be another Bayonetta game, which Bayonetta is, I think, in part owned by Nintendo now. Um, so, oh, two new games from Platinum are pretty hype inducing, certainly. Let's see. I got all the daily quests done. So over here, here are the details. Uh, Bayonetta 3, I guess, was already in development and I've just forgotten about it. Uh, we'll see a change in design process based on Platinum's experience on developing, uh, be developing Bayonetta 1 and 2. Platinum Games is midway through the development of an unannounced title that has never been done before, according to the Tianaba. Uh, he added, I know a lot of people say that, but this game we're working on is truly unlike anything else. It might be so weird if it's something nobody ever has done before that I'm not sure it's going to sell great. It might also be a small, like, single-A indie-style game and not a triple-A Bayonetta-style game that, that's going to be super long. Uh, Platinum Games is aiming to move towards self-publishing as it'll eventually have the freedom to own its intellectual properties and make independent decisions in the future. That's almost a shot directly across the brow of Nintendo and saying we want to publish Bayonetta 2 on uh, PC and get more sales there and I'm sure Nintendo says no to that. Uh, 2019 will be an incredible year for us. This is a lot of hype frankly. 2019 is not the year to say that you're going to do great. Although, quite frankly, so far, uh, so bad with 2019 as far as game releases. So if, if there is some amazing out of nowhere AAA title that, that just turns into the game of the year, this might be the year to surprise people. Uh, let's see. Platinum Games' new approach includes a, way, a move away from relying on external publishers' funding as well as an examination on how it structures game design. Again, they want to get away from Nintendo, which maybe Nintendo wants to get away from them, or I bet Nintendo doesn't care that much. Uh, while Platinum Games has worked for third-party partners in the past, and it's not just Nintendo, I'm pretty sure Platinum has been... Uh, it has been doing third-party work for a lot of people. It... Let's see, while Platinum Games has worked with third-party partners in the past on properties it does not own, such as Bayonetta, so they don't own Bayonetta anymore. Um, I think they originally did, though. Nier Automata, uh, so they don't own the Nier series. And the upcoming game Astral Chain. Uh, it's, so, basically everything Platinum is known for, they don't own the rights to. So, they're doing absolutely the right thing to get their own intellectual property. Uh, the only problem there is these two new intellectual properties that they're working on need to succeed and sell. Uh, the creation of wholly owned properties will not result in the end of third party collaborations however. There's still going to be potentially going to potentially be games which we partner with publishers to do big things with big IPs. It would be very weird if Bayonetta went to another developer or Nier Automata went to another developer uh, because then I feel like both of those game series would go in very different directions. Uh, there might be some co-publishing options, yeah. 
Okay, well, Platinum Games was promising a lot for 2019. All right. Um, so that's going to be it for this recording. We are going to uh, skip over to the European account. Uh, no, we are on the European account. We're going to skip over to the Asian account and try to do most of those daily quests in one more recording. And then that'll be it for streaming, I think. Uh, I'll just do the extra work that I need to do on the Americas account later on. So uh, I'll do it off screen later on, either this evening or tomorrow or Sunday. That's it for this recording. As always, I ask you to like, share, subscribe, comment, and watch every second of my videos. If you want a friend to follow me on any social media sites, there's a whole bunch of links down below in the description box. And if you want to support me even further, there's a link to Patreon, or you can friend me on Steam and gift me a game off my wishlist. Thank you for watching. Have a good evening.